I'm uh, Mitch Marcus. I'm a professor of computer science and linguistics at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm here to welcome you this morning uh, to this symposium to honor um, Barbara Partee of the University of Massachusetts Amherst, who the Franklin Institute is um, honoring this year um, by making her our laureate in computer and cognitive science and presenting to her the Benjamin Franklin Medal in computer and cognitive science. Um, so welcome. I think you're in for a bunch of really wonderful talks today. And with that, I'm going to hand it over um, to Dr. Jatri Das, uh, who's the chief biologist, bioscientist at the Franklin Institute, uh, to make a few uh, comments for the Franklin Institute. Uh, Jayatri. Thanks, Mitch. Good morning, everybody. I'm Jayatri Das, Chief Bioscientist at the Franklin Institute. It's my pleasure to welcome you on behalf of the Institute to this very special program honoring Barbara Partee. We're proud to induct Dr. Partee into the legacy of the Franklin Institute Awards. Since 1824, we've honored more than 2,000 scientists, engineers, inventors, and entrepreneurs for the most groundbreaking achievements of the past two centuries. Our laureates have truly changed the world with their remarkable work, and Dr. Partee is no exception. Typically, every spring, our newest class of laureates gathers together in Philadelphia to participate in a week-long celebration of their achievements. During this time, they engage learners of all ages and levels in a broad range of educational experiences that really represent the Institute's mission to inspire a passion for learning about science and technology. Of course, this isn't a typical year, um, but we're happy to have the opportunity to engage even more people through our online programming, including this morning's symposium. I'd like to give, uh, do a few thanks before we get started. Um, first, I'd like to thank the University of Pennsylvania's Department of Linguistics, the Department of Computer and Information Science, the Initiative in Integrated Language Science and Technology, and MindCore for hosting us today. Penn has been such a wonderful longtime partner of the Franklin Institute in so many initiatives. And we're really grateful to all of you for making this program possible. I'd also especially like to thank Mitch Marcus and Charles Yang for all of their work organizing today's presentations. We owe Dr. Partee's presence here today to Dr. Yang and Dr. Marcus. They're her laureate sponsors, the members of the Franklin Institute's Committee of Science and the Arts who, along with other members of the Computer and Cognitive Science Subcommittee, have led the nomination of Dr. Partee's work over the last few years. Dr. Partee's award, along with six other Benjamin Franklin medals, the Bauer Met Awards for Achievement in Science and for Business Leadership, and the brand new Benjamin Franklin Next Gen Award, will be presented during a virtual ceremony on April 29th at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. There are fantastic videos about each of the laureates that will be debuted during this virtual ceremony. So I definitely encourage all of you to tune in. Details on how to view the ceremony are available at our website at www.fi.edu. So on behalf of the Franklin Institute, congratulations, Dr. Partee, and thank you all for joining us today. Before I turn it back to Mitch to start us off with the program, I'd like to just share a short video that encapsulates the history of the Franklin Institute Awards and show some of the giants who Dr. Partee joins as a Franklin Institute laureate today. So I'm gonna share my screen here to do that video. When, in the course of human events, a spark of inspiration sets the world ablaze with the fires of enlightenment and puts us firmly afoot on the way of progress, connecting us to one another. 
ways that elevate all of humankind to equal stations in which to pursue understanding. A decent respect for innovation requires that we recognize those who so affect our receding horizons, using only that to which the laws of nature entitle them, and declare that these inspired few are the architects of our future, and their insights the foundation upon which humankind distinguishes itself from all others. And with this, we hold that truth is not always self-evident, that it sometimes lies deep below the surface, and that the deserving are those who dare to seek it there, and then return to spread the word and say that with a single moment of inspiration, we have truly moved forward. This is our declaration of progress, a legacy spanning nearly two centuries. The Franklin Institute Awards, the spirit of independence emanates from Philadelphia. Thank you all so much for being with us here today. Mitch, I'll turn it back to you. Good. Thank you, Jantry. Um, um, there we are. Um, so, um, so that video gave you a taste of the Franklin Medals as a whole. Um, the um, the cluster on computer and cognitive science is the newcomer uh, to to the clusters that give out these medals. The rest of the Franklin Institute um, Committee on Science and the Arts goes back to 1824, although the current name we only adopted recently in 1834. Um, but this cluster was first created in uh, 1999. And I want to give you a brief sense of the laureates to whom we've given medals before um, in this part of our focus. So um, uh, going back into the somewhat distant past, Claude Shannon in 1955, and then more recently, George Miller in 1991. Um, those were earlier medals. The Benjamin Franklin Medal Program uh, started um, in the interim. The first awardee of the Benjamin Franklin Medal in Computer and Cognitive Science was Noam Chomsky, uh, followed in intervening years by Marvin Minsky, Aravind Joshi, Judea Pearl, uh, Bill LaBeouf, and uh, Alyssa Newport, um, with many other medalists more on the computer side of things. So um, the um, we're really honored um, to have Barbara as our laureate uh, for this year, as I don't have to tell um, many of you, Barbara. Well, actually, let me leave this bit to Charles. Um, I'm going to hand this to Charles Yang to introduce uh, Barbara. Thank you, Mitch. Um, one of the great things about being part of the program is that we can honor our heroes. I'm not a semanticist, but Barbara has been a hero of mine, not only for her fundamental contribution to semantics, but also for drawing connections between semantics and deep linguistic to other fields, such as computer science, psychology, and philosophy. So without further ado, I'll simply read you the citation for her medal. Um, for her fundamental contributions that synthesize insights from linguistics, philosophy, logic, and psychology to understand how words and sentences combine to express meaning in human language. Um, so today we actually have a special guest to introduce Barbara. So now I turn the camera to Lila Gleiman. Uh, hello, am I on? Yes, you are on. Miracle. Uh... Good morning, uh, Barbara Parti. Uh, I am here uh, as the ghost of linguistics past. Uh, 
as you and I go all the way back, or so you tell me, uh, to the beginnings of your uh, history uh, in this field. So general introductions having been made. Hi there, Barbara, I see you now. Uh, I just want to mention a couple of bookends uh, in our own continuing uh, professional, personal uh, uh, association, uh, which I think began uh, when I had three months uh, as a confused linguistics uh, graduate student, uh, but a uxorious husband who thought that entitled me to give a lecture on language to his Swarthmore class, uh, which I did. I didn't know much, but I could mumble, flying planes can be dangerous. Uh, and I think that was enough of a spark uh, for a listener, uh, a undergraduate, uh, Barbara Partee, uh, who I believe was then casting around uh, for ways to marry uh, her love of languages and the Russian languages, the Russian language with her uh, formidable uh, technical uh, and mathematical uh, skills. And if that struck a spark, great. I'm thinking of putting that uh, on my CV uh, as one of my proudest uh, accomplishments. I'll leave aside the intervening 49 years, uh, but just cap off this hello and a small tribute by saying uh, that Barbara and I continue uh, to this day, uh, and we are on the cusp, uh, or so I must believe, uh, of a new collaboration uh, in which we're attempting to write a paper uh, on the syntax uh, and formal semantics uh, of symmetry. So thank you, Barbara, uh, for all these uh, wonderful years uh, of friendship uh, and rich intellectual uh, intercourse. And I can't wait uh, to hear your talk and that of your uh, associates uh, today. Congratulations. Thank once you, more. Lila. Thank you, Lila, so much. So, okay, that's, that's, thank you, thank you, Lila. That, um, and uh, here's now the beginning of the technical program and uh, the first speaker is the woman, um, is the reason why we're here, not only for today, but also for many of us, uh, uh, us uh, as part of this field. So I give you Barbara Partee. Thank you, Charles. So let me share my screen. Uh, let's see, it should go. Mm -hmm. Here we go, here we go, okay. Oh, no, wait, I have to, oh. Okay, so, th so this is a really wonderful occasion. I thank you all so much for those lovely introductory words and especially Lila, that was a great surprise. And I'm grateful to everyone who's made it possible. The award itself I cherish as a recognition of the field of formal semantics. Many people were crucial for the development of this field and I hope many people will consider this award theirs as well. I accept it on behalf of a great team of people, past and present, and with hopes for the future. I'll mention a few of the many people I'm indebted to in my talk, but let me specifically thank the Franklin Institute for making these awards and thereby supporting science and scientists and inspiring the next generations. And I must thank my sponsors, Mitch Marcus and Charles Yang, for their role in the awards process and for organizing and hosting this wonderful symposium. I promised I would talk about the mysterious combination of serendipity and apparent inevitability that have marked the emergence and development of this still young field. 
And as I was working on the talk, I found that serendipity and inevitability often seem to go hand in hand, like a lightning strike that happens at a random place in time. But in some places and at some times, the conditions are such that it's all but inevitable that a great fire will break out. In doing interviews for my book project on the history of formal semantics, I often ask people how they found their way into the field, whether it's linguistics, semantics, logic, philosophy of language, syntax, and the stories are always interesting and sometimes surprising. We're not like children of doctors becoming doctors, though in Russia, there are a remarkable number of linguistic family lines. So for instance, I interviewed Jeroen Krunendijk in 2011 and Martin Stolkoff in 2013, two Dutch philosophers and formal semanticists who got into Montague grammar very young and who were remarkable for writing virtually all of their work jointly starting with articles in the 70s and their joint PhD dissertation in 1984 and continuing that way all the way through about 2000. I asked Rune and Dijk and Stalkoff how they got into the field and discovered Montague's work so early. It turns out they were friends in secondary school. They worked on the school paper together. They both wrote poetry and they wanted to become writers. And when they found out there weren't really schools for becoming a writer, they decided well, perhaps they should study philosophy the way Albert Camus had begun. So they went to the University of Amsterdam in philosophy and there they both discovered that they very much liked the formal parts, logic, philosophy of science, analytic philosophy. And they decided to study philosophy just for the love of it and to become writers and also to study Dutch to be able to make a living as Dutch teachers. The Dutch curriculum introduced them to linguistics and the Chomsky and syntax and they all but completed a master's degree in that. But then some professor encouraged them to become PhD students in philosophy and pursue that as a career. Up till then, they had no idea that was possible. There's more to their story about how they persuaded their professors to supervise them in studying Montague grammar and pursuing their own work and to do more hiring in philosophy of language. And they were able to attend Keenan's very early formal semantics conference in 1973 where they heard lots of exciting talks and were part of the team that interviewed Renata Barch for the position she then took heading the philosophy department at the University of Amsterdam. So with that very unlikely beginning, Amsterdam quickly became and remains a center for new developments in formal semantics. Well, not totally unlikely, but the Amsterdam history has many other stel stellar figures in it and it's not an accidental place. David Lewis, one of the giants of our field, had a very interesting beginning. He was the son of a professor of government at Oberlin College, and he started Swarthmore the same time I did in the class of 61, declared as a chemistry major. But in 1959, he went for a year to Oxford where his father had a sabbatical year, and he thought that would be a good chance to add some philosophy to his program, which was otherwise going to be all in the sciences. There he, ended up having Iris Murdoch as a tutor. And he heard the last lecture series of the great J.L. Austin, as well as lectures by Ryle, Strawson, Geach, and Grice. He loved it all. He did a lot of writing. He came back to Swarthmore, a dedicated philosophy major, graduated in 1962, and went to Harvard to work very independently with Quine. As for my own beginnings, Starting in high school, I loved math and I loved languages and I saw no relation between them. I loved grammar more than literature. And in math, I especially enjoyed 10th grade Euclidean geometry because of the logic in it. I can remember arguing with my parents and using logic on them, <laughs> it didn't work. But in high school, I didn't love algebra because it was taught like a recipe book. I only came to appreciate it later when I started teaching math for linguists in graduate school and found in Birkhoff's 1966 Lattice Theory book, an introduction to the general question, what is an algebra? And a whole general discussion of axioms and models and realized how algebra really is all about studying structures, which is what linguists are doing all the time. At Swarthmore, to be in the honors program, you had to choose a major and two related minors. I asked the head of the math department if I could possibly major in math and minor in Russian and philosophy, even though I saw no connection. They were just my three favorite subjects. He said he had heard of something called mathematical linguistics 
or machine translation. And he imagined I could make up a story about that. So I did with no real idea of what it meant, having up till that point only Lila's one, one brief introduction in my freshman psychology class taught by Henry Gleitman. But they did let me do such a program. I think, I suspect now in hindsight, it would, may have been a lucky byproduct of the sexism of the time, since no one, including me, was asking what on earth I would do with such a degree and such a odd combination of subjects. But here enters a nice bit of serendipity for me. My uncle, having heard of my curiosity about something called mathematical linguistics and being an MIT PhD in engineering and on their mailing list, sent me the program for a conference at MIT organized by Roman Jakobson and called Structure of Language and Its Mathematical Aspects. Well, a vision of paradise. I wrote to all the American participants, that included Chomsky and Zelig Harris and many more, uh, to ask if there was anything a young student could do in the summer of 1960 to learn more about this so-called mathematical linguistics in order to find out if it was something I might be able to do graduate work in. Lots of people actually replied with very encouraging letters, including Chomsky, and all roads pointed to the University of Pennsylvania. No one else had any summer possibilities to offer, but several thought that Penn might. And Lila Gleitman and Carlotta Smith, both then faculty wives at Swarthmore, who I occasionally babysat for, were also then graduate students at Penn, as Lila said. They put me in touch with someone at Penn who told me, why yes, there's going to be a seminar this summer funded for all participants by NSF on structural linguistics for people with backgrounds in mathematics, philosophy, or psychology, taught by Henry Heesch, logician and philosopher at Penn. That was perfect for me. And it turned out that quite independently, David Lewis and Gil Harmon also found out about that seminar and participated in it. All, they were at Swarthmore with me. That was the introduction to linguistics for all three of us. And you'll hear more about David Lewis and Gil Harmon as I go on. Uh, he gave us an algebraic foundation and then we did Harris style transformations and distributional analysis. I loved it. The timing of that summer seminar was amazing. It was amazing good luck, especially since at Penn they knew that their PhD graduate Noam Chomsky was about to launch a PhD program at MIT with a similar emphasis, a program that had not been officially announced or advertised anywhere. So it was absolutely a matter of serendipity that I found my way into quote mathematical, i.e. formal linguistics and into the new MIT program. But it was not an accident that I rushed through that door as soon as it was open to me. And it was not an accident that I chose math as my minor for my PhD program in linguistics. Minors were obligatory back then, with courses in automata theory, logic, set theory, and model theory. While David Lewis and I were both in graduate school in Cambridge then in the early 60s, he sometimes came to Chomsky's lectures, and I took one course from Quine. We were friends, and my mathematician apartment mate and I sometimes had him over for dinner. So when, a couple of years after I got to UCLA for my first job, when David Lewis told me that the logician and philosopher Richard Montague was starting to do work on the semantics of natural language that I might find interesting. That was a huge bit of serendipity, but one that in a sense I had been preparing for all along without knowing it. Montague was not easy to understand. He used a lot of high powered logic and, and he, he, he gave no quarter when he lectured. But I had gotten enough background that when I could, when I asked David after class at various times to explain things like what's a lambda, I could kind of understand his answers and I could hugely appreciate the enterprise and imagine what it could mean for linguistics. So, so now uh, away from these, these sort of individual strains of how he got into things and questions about the development of the field. So there's some factors of apparent inevitability but always some matters of chance, I think. Some things might seem to make the rise of formal semantics for natural language inevitable. There were important developments going on, at first with hardly any mutual knowledge, in logic and philosophy of language on the one hand and linguistics on the other. 
One could speak of the rise of formal philosophy and the rise of formal theoretical linguistics. I'm not going into any details here. This is, I've given other talks and I've written a lot of papers about this. I've discussed these developments from Frege through Carnap and Tarski and other philosophers and logicians to Montague and Lewis and Terry Parsons in many talks and papers, and I won't repeat them here. But on the linguistic side, the Chomsky revolution that started with syntactic structures in 1957 began in the 60s to lead to a search for a more adequate semantics to go with it than the initial cats and fodder and postal efforts, leading to the rise of very interesting work in generative semantics and interpretive semantics, and increasingly interesting semantic questions being raised. Though the linguists' questions tended to be very structural, all about scopes and ambiguities. My 1971 paper on, on the requirement that transformations preserve meaning was an analysis of some of the problems with each approach. I knew enough to be dissatisfied, but I had no idea how to do better. That paper was published in 1971, but it had been presented at an April 1969 conference when I had only barely begun to get acquainted with Montague's work. It's kind of a snapshot of how linguists were struggling with semantics before Montague's work gave us a very different view of other questions we could ask and other tools we could work with. There were certainly common interests and some shared goals between linguists, logicians, and philosophers. But in the 1960s, there were serious obstacles to getting together. Linguists in the 60s did not know type theory, did not know the semantic motivation of categorical grammar, namely the idea, Frege's idea of using function argument structure to build up semantic, semantics of larger constituents from their parts, didn't know any higher order logic, everyone was working in first order logic, didn't know lambdas, and we didn't have any idea that truth conditions could be relevant to meaning, let alone basic to it. I think there, are, there were some partial exceptions in, in, in Jim McCauley and Ed Keenan, for instance. And logicians and philosophers didn't know much syntax except for traditional grammars. There was a common idea among them that language was too unruly and too full of vagueness and ambiguity to ever analyze formally. Luckily, there were quite a number of exceptions to that including Ebert Bett and then Fritz Stahl in Amsterdam, and Yehoshua Bar-Hillel, Henry Heesch, Julius Moravchik, Jerry Fodor, and Jerry Katz. And from Chomsky's years as a junior fellow at Harvard in the 50s, at least Goodman, Quine, Putnam, Scheffler, and Bar-Hillel. There were some active efforts. Originally, they all came from the philosophy side. Uh, of various people to bring linguists and philosophers together. Fritz Stahl was an important one. He founded the new journal Foundations of Language in 1965 with the explicit goal to bring together work in linguistics, philosophy, logic, psychology, and even more fields to try to understand language and its foundations. 1965 was when I got my PhD. So in my student years, this kind of cooperation definitely had not begun. The original group of editors of that journal included Stahl, Morris Halley, the philosopher Benson Mates, and others. And Stahl was also the one who invited Montague to teach a seminar with him in Amsterdam in 1966, which turned out to be a, a, an important turning point for Montague. More on that later. Yehoshua Bar Hillel was an important people. I've often commented on the paper that Bar Hillel published in Language in 1964 arguing that the time was right for linguists and philosophers of language to work together to exploit the great progress that had been made in both fields. Chomsky's reply in language in 1965, when he was still a graduate student, was that the artificial languages of logic were too different from natural languages for the logician's methods to be of any use for the linguist's goals of understanding the properties of the human faculty of language. Bar-Hillel kept trying. In the summer of 1967, Stahl, Bar-Hillel, and Haskell Curry organized a symposium 
during the Third International Congress for Logic, Methodology, and Philosophy of Science in Amsterdam on the role of formal logic in the evaluation of argumentation in ordinary language. Bar Hillel prepared an opening position paper, and participants included Montague, Jerry Katz, Dummett, Hintika, and others. As Stahl noted in his, in his uh, um, edited, edited version of, of parts of that symposium, quite a few people then knew of Montague's work, and quite a few knew about MIT linguistics, represented by Katz, but few knew both. Bar Hillel also corresponded with Montague and had conversations with Chomsky, but never managed to persuade them to meet or interact or to study each other's work seriously. Donald Davidson and Gil Harmon played a big role. They were both in or near Princeton from 1967 to 76, and they played a major role in efforts to encourage linguists and philosophers to interact. In August 69, they organized a conference on the semantics of natural language at the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences in Stanford. The participants were linguists Bach, Fillmore, Lakoff, Macaulay, and Parti, and philosophers Davidson, Geach, Harmon, Kaplan, Quine, Stahl, and Fermazin. Montague was not invited, which I thought was a pity. I found the conference stimulating and interesting, but no one changed anyone's mind on any important issues. Quine states in his autobiography that the conference was, quote, a fiasco at bridge building, unquote. Nevertheless, a wonderful huge edited volume came out of that conference, including papers by many who were not at the conference, including Montague and Kripke. And Davidson and Harmon then organized a six-week summer institute in philosophy of language and linguistics at UC Irvine in the summer of 71, divided into two three-week sessions. Each week had lectures by three philosophers and one linguist, and the so-called students were themselves all young philosophy professors, including Rich Thomason, Bob Stalmaker, Gareth Evans, Bill Leicht, and many other distinguished, now, now distinguished philosophers. I was the linguist for the first session, and I attended the lectures by Davidson, Harmon, and Grice. And I commuted to the second session to hear Strassen, David Kaplan, Quine, and the second session linguist, Had Ross, as well as the extra series by Saul Kripke on his then new work, Naming and Necessity. The long discussion periods following each lecture, as well as many discussions outside of lecture time, yielded a great deal of mutual education and lasting friendships. I feel like I got a good bit of my philosophical education that summer. The Institute was held in August 71. Montague had just been murdered in March 71, a tragedy and a terrible shock to everyone. He had only started writing his natural language related papers in 67 and 68. I was still just trying to learn to understand his work. But that summer was also my first experience teaching a little bit of it with help from, quote, students like Thomason and Stalmaker. And I made and talked about a few first steps towards integrating Montague grammar and Chomsky's transformational grammar. Davidson and Harmon themselves tended to favor first order extensional logic over the kind of higher order intentional logic that Montague used. They were sympathetic to the work of the generative semanticists and Davidson did not have a high regard for Montague, but their efforts did a great deal to bring linguists and philosophers together. Ed Keenan merits a special mention. I think I'm pretty sure he was the first linguist to host a conference aimed at bringing linguists and philosophers together. It was in 1973 while he was at Cambridge University and its title, Formal Semantics of Natural Language, used the then unfamiliar term formal semantics for the first time among linguists. The book from the conference was published in 1975. Participants included David Lewis, me, John Lyons, Ersten Dahl, Peter Siren, Hans Kamp, Renata Barch, Arnim von Stecko, who I, I haven't talked about, but did a great deal to get uh, cement, formal semantics started in Germany. George Lakoff, Peter Zgall, Steve Izzard, Joe Emmons, York Wilkes, Ed Keenan, Hadros, and more. It was a quite eclectic and very interesting group. And that, and that was where Grunendijk and Stockhoff got to meet all these people uh, for the first time and, and take all that they had learned back to Amsterdam. 
quite a few of us met each other for the first time at that conference. Ed had and still has very broad tastes and an inclusive and welcoming nature that made that a very, very productive and congenial conference. So now various people and contexts in this development that's partly serendipity and partly, partly it seems inevitable. So Montague, the, the leading figure in this story, in high school in Stockton, he studied the three foreign languages that they offered, Latin, French, and Spanish. He was also serious about music there and in his uh, undergraduate and graduate work at Berkeley, giving organ recitals and served, and he served as the minister of music at a church in Oakland. As an undergraduate at Berkeley, he studied mathematics, philosophy, and Semitic languages. He continued graduate work in all three areas, especially with Fischel in classical Arabic, with Marenke and Mates in philosophy, and with Tarski and his advisor in mathematics and philosophy, receiving MA in mathematics in 53 and a PhD in philosophy in 57. So he did antecedently have some interest in language, but much more in logic, mathematics, and philosophy. So why did he change gears in the second half of the 60s and start working on formal semantics of natural language after working on logic, set theory, and recursive function theory, which were properly Tarskian topics, which he, he repeatedly said he valued most highly even after he started working on natural language. I've written elsewhere about two, two apparent sources uh, of, of that kind of new work of his. One was the logic textbook that he and Donald Kalish wrote in the early 1960s, which paid unusually careful attention to algorithms for translating back and forth between first order logic and a regimented subset of natural English. Another was a page I found in the Montague archives at UCLA that had, that had a, the preamble that he would give orally to one of his early talks on English as a formal language, though he didn't write this on his handout. It, it, his preamble included, this work is the result of two annoyances. And they turned out to be one, the ordinary language versus formal language wars in the philosophy of language, especially in England, but not only. And secondly, quote, the great sound and fury that nowadays issues from MIT under the name of mathematical linguistics or the new grammar a clamor not to the best of my knowledge accompanied by any accomplishments. I, I was just, I was shocked when I read that. Ivano Caponegro in his biography of Montague in progress identifies as another really important crucial turning point, maybe the most crucial one, Montague's sabbatical in Amsterdam in 1966, where Fritz Stahl invited him to co-teach a seminar on linguistics and philosophy on Chomsky's 1965 aspects of the theory of syntax, brand new then, and Quine's 1960 classic word and object. Hank Kyle explained both to me and to Ivano when we, we each interviewed him, how Stahl would put some syntactic trees on the blackboard to show how Chomsky would handle certain kinds of constructions. And Montague, would then fill the board with formulas for how he would analyze the semantics of those constructions. And Stahl would have to interpret Montague's com complex looking formulas for the students. I think Ivano is probably right that that was a major turning point. It, was, it certainly was clear that by the time of Montague's English as a formal language, which was taught in a seminar I attended in 1968, a seminar at Montague's, Montague, clearly thought he could, quote, do better than, than what the linguists were doing in semantics, and that it would be worthwhile to devote some effort to it, effort that actually continued through, through the rest of his short life. And I think he appreciated, as he got closer, as he went farther along, he appreciated that it was not such a, a simple little job as he had first imagined. And his work, although it was just a few years, left a great legacy for the rest of us to work with. So there's some counterfactual questions one can raise. And at a workshop organized by Rich Thomason in Michigan uh, on the UCLA years in the beginnings of the formal semantics, two counterfactual questions were raised. What if Montague had never lived? Or what if Montague had not died so young? 
There was no clear resolution, of course, but those of us there didn't think that formal semantics would have gotten off to such a flying start as it did in the 70s if Montague had never turned his energies to it. About the other, what if he hadn't died when he did? We had much less idea, only that it might have been a little harder and taken a little longer for the linguists to, to so to speak, take possession of formal semantics as we did by the mid 80s. David Lewis could well have become the founder of formal semantics. He had the tools. He knew more linguistics than Montague did, a great deal more. And he had a very compatibilist temperament about the many topics on which he believed there was more than one way to do things. But that wasn't his main interest. He declined, for instance, to write an article for my first anthology on Montague grammar in 1976, instead giving me permission to reprint his seminal paper, Generative Semantics, there. He made many wonderful lasting contributions. And I know that my colleague, Angelica Kratzer, very much considers him and not Montague to be her principal ancestor in formal semantics. After Montague's death, so I was at UCLA from 65 to 72, and I mostly supervised syntax PhDs, but also Frank Heaney and Larry Horn. And in the year after Montague's death, David Kaplan and I jointly supervised Montague's two PhD students, Michael Bennett and Enrique Delacruz, and I actually taught two quarters of Montague grammar. Terry Parsons and I both moved to UMass Amherst in 1972, and Emin Bach came in 1973 when they got married. Terry and Emin and I found UMass an ideal breeding ground for fruitful linguistics philosophy joint development of formal semantics. We had a brand new linguistics department and an established good philosophy department, the fruitfulness of joint seminars, joint NSF grants, and joint advising of students in linguistics and philosophy. We had a series of great students in the 70s and 80s who made those seminars and research projects wonderful. That, that they really made our department, I think. But Robin Cooper, Muffy Siegel, Greg Carlson, Paul Hirschbuehler, Elizabeth Engdahl, Mike Flynn, Ken Ross, Irena Heim, Gennaro Kierkia, Dorit Abush in philosophy, Mats Ruth, Jonathan Mitchell, Craig e. Roberts, Marit Kadmon, Jay Wong Choi, Sandro Zucchi, Arnold Chen in philosophy, Karina Wilkinson, Paul Portner, Hotza Ruma, just to mention the ones whose dissertations I chaired in the 70s and 80s. That was an explosive and wonderful period. After Terry left in 79, there was less involvement of philosophy students or faculty. But then Angelica Kratzer joined our department in 85, and we had and still have many joint seminars within linguistics and lots of great students, increasingly supervised by Angelica, who now has finally retired. About the most recent years, I'll only mention that we had several wonderful years with Lisa Matthewson on our faculty, expanding our, our work on, on uh, uh, endangered languages, and then several wonderful years with Chris Potts on our faculty, and now many wonderful years with Seth Cable on our faculty, joined still more recently by Vincent Omer and Anna Aregui. So what, if anything, was either inevitable or serendipitous about the developments at UMass? And I think I'm running out of time, so I will shorten this a little. But meeting Terry before we each, uh, not long before we each decided we were moving and discovering we were both interested in UMass and influencing each other, that, that was a great serendipity. And Don Freeman, who founded our linguistics department just 50 years ago, when he, when he had founded it, he remembered that when he met me at UCLA in 66, I told him how I loved Vermont. So he called me up and told me, come to UMass, it's less than 50 miles from Vermont. That wasn't the only reason, but I did. I had never heard of UMass Amherst before. It was not that long since it had been an agricultural college. It's amazing. And Don Freeman had the foresight to get the 1974 LSA Institute at UMass. I won't spend time talking about it, but that was that not only had a huge semantics and philosophy of language component, but it also was something like a coming out party for UMass and sort of put us on the map. So once Terry and Emin and I were all there, the enterprise picked up momentum, attracting more wonderful graduate students in a virtuous cycle. That's non-serendipitous once you get started. I could say much more than I have in other places, um, as in many other people and places were important. But time and space constraints mean I have to stop here. Happily, the rest of the program today 
will bring us closer to the present and with glimpses of the future. Thanks. Thank you, Barbara. Um, as a reminder, um, please submit your questions through the Q&A and uh, the questions will be monitored and selected for the speaker to answer. And also the most of the slides and handouts for the for today's presentation are online at the website um, from which you have you've been able to join the program. Hi, um, so I'm Seth Cable. I'm moder mo moderating the questions um, for Barbara Partee's presentation. Um, so as Charles just said, please submit your questions um, into the uh, Q&A panel. And um, we only have time for, we have only about 10 minutes uh, uh, for questions right now. Um, but um, uh, let me start off, Bar uh, Barbara, there's a question from uh, Dave Partee. I'm gonna unmute, I'm gonna, so I'm gonna do this process of, um, inviting Dave Partee to ask a question. Go ahead, uh, Dave. Yeah, I noticed on one of the slides, uh, I think it was a 1969 Stanford conference. Uh, you had the name Vermeisen on there. Was that Bruce Vermeisen? Yes, yes it is. You know him? This is my son, Dave, by the way, that I'm talking to. <laughs> yes, that's yeah. Bruce Vermeisen. Yeah, here's, here's my undergraduate honors advisor at Berkeley. I don't oh, remember you mentioning that, that you knew oh, him, so. Wonderful. <laughs> well, thank you, <laughs> yes. Excellent. Um, I'm going to move on to a question by uh, Anna uh, Polakoff, if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. I'm going to invite you to ask your question. Yeah, hi, thank you. So I don't hear you. Now I don't hear Seth. Okay, uh, I've just invited Anna to ask her a question and some, there might've been some kind of glitch. I, I heard you introduce, I mean, I heard the first two words and then nothing. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, so anybody who has studied both linguistics and analytic philosophy knows that they both went their separate ways. And even if Irvine was an attempt to build bridges among them, what I want to ask you is, would you say that building bridges is something that may be done? Or would you say that any attempt to build bridges between analytic philosophy and linguistics is doomed to fail? And my example was Bendler's Linguistics in Philosophy, which, which is a very great book, but actually he was very influential in linguistics, but he's almost known by nobody in analytic philosophy. Hmm. That's it. <laughs> oh, that's a tough question. No, I, I mean, I think, I think that on the one hand, I think the bridge building has been extremely successful. On the other hand, as I think I alluded to at one point, ha having with the linguistics and the ling linguists and philosophers really had to work together in the 70s to get formal semantics started. But it's true that by the middle of the 80s, the field had become a subfield of linguistics. And I know there were many places where the philosophers were not studying it at all. And I, but then I remember giving a talk in Stanford around 2000 and something, uh, 2011, I think it was, talking about my regrets that there was no longer joint work. And then, uh, then Delia Graf, uh, Delia Farah uh, uh, spoke up and said, wait, it's not true. At MIT, Irena Heim and Bob Stalnaker have been teaching formal semantics to linguists and philosophers together. And indeed, there was a great generation of, of philosophers from that time, including Jason Stanley, Zoltan Sabo, and Delia, and, and others, who, who did bring it back into philosophy. So as long as the lines of communication stay open, I know what people are interested in changes, and, and there might not be as much formal semantics in philosophy uh, as one might wish. Uh, I think I think it's all absolutely worthwhile. It enriches the field in ways that we don't go backwards from. Thank you. So next is a uh, question from Brian uh, Bukala. Hi, Brian. Hey, thanks for that wonderful talk. I was very curious when you were talking a little bit about um, 
David Lewis in his connection with Montague and how he was somewhat resistant to Montague grammar. I was a little bit surprised about that. And I was wondering if you could oh. maybe talk some more because uh, I can sort of see what you mean when you say that Angelica considers Lewis to be her sort of ancestor, because I, in my own mind, I, I certainly see some distinctions, but was there any particular reason or set of reasons uh, why, why Lewis was somewhat resistant, like any fundamental reasons perhaps do? I didn't, I didn't say that, did I? I, I, oh. I, I don't I, think I said it. I didn't mean to say it. No, Davidson. Ah, Davidson. Davidson. Donald Davidson was definitely resistant. Maybe that's what you were picking up on. Um, oh, was, I think was, I must, I, okay, I must have yeah, totally misunderstood. It, it was Davidson who didn't invite Montague to either of those conferences. No, David Lewis was the one who, who came and came over to my office one day and said, hey, hey, this guy in, in our department is doing stuff you might be interested in. And when I started sitting in on Montague's seminar uh, for the first time in 68, David was right there with me. And, and he was the one who was happy to answer all my stupid questions like, what's a lambda? No, David, David Lewis, I mean, his paper, General Semantics, is it's partly independent and is partly a way of introducing linguists to the kind of things that Montague was doing. Montague wrote in a rather incomprehensible style for many people. I mean, even Max Cresswell, the philosopher and logician, said he, could, he couldn't read Montague's papers. He was glad he spent a year at UCLA. Um, so, so David, David, David is comprehensible, and he knows how to talk to linguists because he knows linguistics. Uh, no, he absolutely. They they discuss things together. There's, you know, David Lewis left a great correspondence, but not hardly any with Montague because they were just on the same hallway. So they, they could just uh, I thought, yeah, I thought there was a reason because it was Lewis that you had invited to contribute and in, uh, to your. Montague grammar volume, and he decided not to. And I, maybe I misunderstood the he reasons. Just, he just said he didn't have time because there were other things that he was working on at that period. Oh, okay, I got for you. Him, for him, it was just that, yes, yes, he liked the philosophy of language stuff. Yes, he liked the formal semantics enterprise, but he also was very interested in metaphysics and in several other kinds of things. So he was working on possible worlds and, and you know, all, all those uh, all those other things he's famous for. Right. Thank yeah. you. Well, um, Charles, are we at about time or do we have time for one more question? One more question, maybe. All right. So there's a question from Daniel Lassiter. Um, so I'm going to invite him to talk. Hi. Thanks so much for that um, really extremely interesting kind of overview of the history of the field. I, I'm interested in your thoughts about a relationship with a field that wasn't mentioned, um, cognitive psychology. So, so it's really striking um, how much engagement there was uh, in the, the area you're talking about between formal syntax and cognitive psychology, uh, you know, especially through the kind of growth of psycholinguistics as compared to the you know, almost complete lack of engagement with formal semantics in cognitive psychology. And I'm just curious if you could tell us a bit about your thoughts about why that, um, why the fields developed that way and why it took them so long to, to become engaged with each other. Uh, good question. And it's good you asked it because this, this uh, award is supposedly in, in computer and cognitive science. And, and I, I forgot to mention anything about uh, cognitive psychology. Yeah, so, 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 yeah, we don't have much time, so I got to give a short answer, though, in fact, it needs a long answer. And I have written some papers I could point you to. Um, so one problem was that the Freudian tradition was clearly anti-psychologistic. It was kind of Platonist that language exists as an abstract object and can be studied separately from studying human knowledge of language. And another, another thing was that the the possible world semantics seemed so extremely fruitful and crucial for formal semantics that posited uh, all these possible worlds. And, and it's easy to work out that there must be non denumerably many distinct possible worlds. Well, that can't fit in a speaker's head. So I, I started writing papers from the very beginning, you know, sort of worrying about how on earth can we reconcile this field that uses all these tools that it's hard to imagine 
putting in people's head. Uh, how can we reconcile that with the Chomskyan enterprise, which is the study of the human linguistic capacity? And that really seemed to me for many, many years to be a, a really difficult obstacle. And I talked about working with partial models or classes of models or things to try to pare it down to sizes that could fit in people's head, but I had no idea you know, how one might do it. And it wasn't till later that I started to appreciate the work of Tyler Burge and, and, uh, and Bob Stalnaker about the whole notion of what it is for meanings to be in the head shouldn't be taken in quite such a solipsist internalist view or doesn't have to be taken in the sort of solipsist internalist view that, that Jerry Fodor and I think sometimes Chomsky seem to take it in. So that it can be about relations between um, um, cognitive entities and the environment they're operating in. So, and in the meantime, of course, there has been lots of psychosemantic work. Um, uh, and I think, yeah, when, when it's Florian's turn, I hope we'll hear more uh, about, about recent work. Um, so, so yes, yes, it was a problem, partly because it was the newest subfield and partly because there was this, these apparent clashes in the foundations. Okay. Okay. So let's move on. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you. Um, um, well, all the speakers today are very well known, so I'll make the introduction very short. Our next speaker is uh, Gennaro Kirkia from Harvard, please. Hi, everybody. And a very special hug to Barbara. Um, and the <clears throat> sort of uh, themes that I've chosen today um, are meant to play a double role. On the one hand, to give you some sense of where the history that Barbara uh, sort of uh, went through led us. And also, I think they are all themes that are close to her heart uh, because, you know, I've learned them from her. So a common thread to many current results in semantics concerns the role of logic in determining grammaticality patterns. What has sort of come to light is that some sentences owe their status as ungrammatical, not because of you know, something wrong with their syntax, but because they are logically determined. That is to say, either logically true or logically false. And hence, in some sense, informationally trivial. This immediately raises a demarcation issue, since many logically determinate sentences are totally grammatical. Now, this is a recurrent problem. In my recent UMass dissertation, for example, lovingly supervised by Professor Parti, I tried to develop a theory according to which a sentence like two, John promised Mary not to hurt herself, is deviant because it's a contradiction. And Robin Cooper, in his review of my dissertation for a publisher, wrote, the claim that control violations are contradiction is by far the least convincing feature of Kierkegaard's dissertation. Um, so my plan is to discuss how logic determines grammaticality patterns and the demarcation problem, which logically determines sentences are ungrammatical and why. And as I do this, to go over you know, the views that some you know, bright young people have developed on this theme and see where that leaves us uh, concerning the relation between grammar and logic. So let me begin by an easy example. <clears throat> Suppose that we are discussing the question of how many assignments will I have graded by, say, dinner time because we want to go out. 
Well, I might reply, you know, maybe even 50 if you let me work. Or I could reply, you know, maybe not even one if you don't let me work. But I cannot reply, maybe even one. That sounds immediately awkward, perhaps a lame attempt at a joke or something. And the question is why? Why is it that three is perceived as so distinctly deviant in addressing the question under discussion? And the key clearly has to be in the meaning of the word even, right? Um, so even P um, asserts P and presupposes uh, that somehow P is the least likely alternative under consideration um, and therefore the most newsworthy. Um, in you know, assessing this, you have, however, to take into account um, what is the relation between the alternatives. So if the question is how many assignments will I have graded by dinner time, the space of positive answers will have the form, you know, I will have graded 50, I will have graded 40, I will have graded 10, I will have graded one assignment. And these alternatives are ordered by entailment in the sense that if you have graded 50 assignments, then you've graded 40 and then you've graded 30 and so on. So the entailment goes from the high number to the small number in the positive answer space. Negation flips this pattern, reverses it. So if you haven't graded even one assignment, then you haven't graded 10, you haven't graded 20, you haven't graded 30 and so on. Okay. So if you take this into consideration, then when you say maybe even 50, you are going at the strong end of the scale. You are going to the sentence that has a chance at being the least likely because it's the one that entails all the others. Um, on the other hand, if you are in the negative space of answer, the opposite is the case. That is to say, the strongest, therefore the least likely uh, answer is not even one. And so when you say even one, you are going at the weakest end of the uh, space of answers. And that cannot be the least likely uh, alternative because you cannot be less likely that something that entails you. And so your reaction to sentence C is one through which you go through very quickly, you prove a theorem of probability theory, essentially. And if this is not the explanation for this pattern, then what is? Um, now, this example is not only interested in its own uh, right, but it's also because it sheds light on a phenomenon that is extremely pervasive in natural language, and that is polarity-sensitive quantification, which, for instance, every natural language in some form or other has, and in English it's represented by uh, things like any. And things like any like to be in a, a positive or upward entailing uh, context. So, you know, uh, you cannot say things like if you are hungry, there are any cookies left. But you can say if there are any cookies left, you won't go hungry. So you see the string, there are any cookies left, yields deviance in a positive environment and doesn't kill deviance in a sort of negative done when entailing environment. The very same string shifted from one context to the other shifts its balance. And notice how bad it sounds. If there are, if you're hungry, there are any cookies left, it's virtually worse salad. And yet it is very likely that this deviance is due to the fact 
that in fact, any means something like even one. So how many cookies can we count on? If you are so angry, you can count on even one. That's terrible. But if you can count on even one, you won't go hungry. That's perfect. And that essentially follows from the sort of probability theory theorem that I've uh, uh, sketched above. And so this is, you know, the kind of things that um, linguists have increasingly be paying attention to uh, and are uh, sort of explaining in terms of logic. And, you know, the range of constructions for which some deviance in their logical status has been advocated as an explanation uh, for their uh, ungrammaticality is quite large and growing every day. Exception phrases, measure phrases, uh, MPIs I've already mentioned, comparatives, the definite effects. So, you know, there is every solution to this problem. It's weird, supposed to, there is a solution to this problem. And, you know, that has been accounted for along the lines that I just sketched. And in fact, the same sort of extends to presuppositions. Uh, some presupposition failures are not ungrammatical. So if I tell you, maybe that's not true, but I just know it is. That's a presupposition failure, which is perfectly grammatical. Or I met the Italian who is not Italian. That's a presupposition failure that is perfectly grammatical. But if you look at things like John broke his bike for an hour, or, you know, so you must count distinction, like there are three bloods on the floor. These are, you know, have been accounted for in the literature in terms of contradictory presuppositions. Um, and these are clearly ungrammatical. And so the issue reproduces itself both in the realm of entailment and logical consequences and in the realm of presuppositions. Um, by logical determinacy, I mean something like domain neutrality. So uh, a sentence is domain neutral if its value is constant. Uh, that is to say, it's always true or always false across, across domains, across world, and across models. And another term often used in this connection is permutation invariant. And so we are, we have to face this demarcation problem. Some logically determined sentence are deemed to be ungrammatical and others are not. So even one in response to a question like how many assignments would you have graded is deviant in a way that, you know, run of the contradictions, tautologies, are not. So is John up to task? Mm, he is and he isn't. But it, it has this, the form of a contradiction, but it's perfectly grammatical and in fact uh, informative. And also, there is a, an interesting difference, right? That the contradictoriness of something like even associated with a small uh, quantity uh, uh, expression in an upward entailing context, this kind of contradictoriness needs an argument. You need to get at it through analysis. While the contradictoriness of it rains and it doesn't rain, doesn't need much of uh, you know, uh, coaching to see that is a contradiction. And so what are these differences about? What is it that determines them? Now, before telling you something about how to address this question, I want you to stop and realize uh, the importance of it and the sort of, you know, it has the status of kind of a Copernican revolution, no? So 
not all syntactically well-formed sentences are grammatical, and maybe this is not so earth-shaking, but it means that logic enters directly into the definition of grammaticality. It means that if there is no logic, then there is no grammar. Let me tell you what the idea is, building on a relatively recent uh, proposal by one of uh, the bright young researchers I was alluding to before. So this is the shape of our two test cases. On the left, you have a, a sentence which is perhaps contradictory, but not ungrammatical, it's not perceived as ungrammatical. And on the right, you have a sentence that is contradictory and is ungrammatical. And what I've done here, I've drawn their syntax in a, a rough way, um, and I've highlighted uh, the contrast between the so-called function words or the functional spine of this sentence and the content words. And so in the first sentence, the only content words is the word smart, the adjective. And in the sentence to the right, it would be whatever you choose to put in the place of the noun phrase and the verb phrase, okay? Now, here comes the difference. You can compute the logical determinacy of the sentence to the right independently of what you choose as your noun phrase and verb phrase. That sentence will come out contradictory no matter how you choose what to insert as your content words. The sentence to the left is instead different. That sentence will be contradictory only if you choose the same adjective. If you choose to insert the same adjective in the two adjectival slots. Uh, but if you choose two different adjectives, the sentence wouldn't be contradictory. And this is kind of the idea. Ungrammatical domain neutral sentences, which I call G trivial, grammatically trivial, are those whose neutrality, that is to say whether they are true or false for any D, can be determined on the basis of the functional spine alone. And they come to have a definite uh, truth value, no matter how you pick your content words. On the other hand, um, grammatical uh, denutal sentences have a determinate truth value whenever we replace content words with other content words in a uniform way. So for instance, a pair of identical content words is repaired with a, a different pair of identical content words. And so this latter won't come out as deviant, while the former will be perceived as deviant. And let me elaborate on this by telling you about a friendly amendment of this original insight by Gajewski, by another uh, bright, this guy is more of a philosopher than a linguist, while Gajewski is more of a linguist than a philosopher. And here is his amendment. Imagine that you get your sentences and you assign to them a structure, and then you allow yourself to freely insert a modulating function on any non-functional item, on any content words, okay? And a modulating function is simply something that maps something of any type into something of the same type. Very unconstrained for the time being. Let me give you an example so that you see where this is headed. So take a sentence like, there is any cookie left, under the assumption that this means there is even one cookie left and that is deviant for the same reason as uh, we saw before. And so, you know, what you have is something that looks like this, uh, like in nom Roman numeral two, you have the even, you have this, which is logical stuff, and then you have your content words, which you can modulate by inserting uh, functions 
that can change, so to speak, the meaning of cookie and the meaning of land. And you do the same for it rains and it doesn't, right? So uh, it rains and it doesn't, we'll have this form, okay? And now you see that this is going to come out false, no matter how you pick your F and your F prime. And this instead is going to come up false only if you use special F and F prime, namely identity. That is to say, if you don't modulate or you modulate in a uniform way. And so this is then, you know, a, a kind of a neat way of getting at the same, uh, same result as before, right? So for any possibly modulated formula or sentence, that formula is domain neutral, uh, logically determined if for any uh, sort of monotone assignment, that is any assignment that, uh, you know, interprets this modulating formula in a uniform way, uh, you get something that is logically determined, okay? While a sentence is grammatically determined is, you know, simply for any assignment whatsoever, the sentence come out as logically de determined. And so this is uh, a slightly different way of achieving the same results and the same idea as, um, uh, as uh, Gajewski, okay? So I think I already went through that by, with my hand waving. Now, why uh, is Del Pinal uh, amendment uh, useful? Well, there are some technical reasons that I'm not going to get into, uh, but also it's a nice way of grounding functionally uh, sort of this notion of G triviality. Things uh, that you know, are perceived as deviant are things that are contradictory beyond repair in the sense that no reinterpretation of the content words can fix that up. While our interpretation of the content words in the case of classical tautologies and contradictions clearly can rescue them. And so that's a good functional grounding of this whole idea, I think. Um, now, so some overarching uh, feature of this mode of thinking is that both these proposals rely on the distinction, the key distinction between functional and content words. And this distinction is clearly related to the distinction between logical and non-logical words. So if you are hating what I'm saying, this is the distinction you want to attack. You want to say that there is no uh, difference between functional and content terms because you know, this way of discriminating and carving out a place for logic relies on, on, on that distinction very heavily. Um, there are some problems, you know, some nitpicking that I would normally do at a normal conference, uh, but I won't here. Um, and instead, I will, you know, point at further sort of serendipities, to use Barbara's word, uh, uh, in this way of, of looking at things. So, you know, there has been a lot of discussion uh, on many occasions on the rubric of things like coercion. So for instance, Chomsky used facts as such this uh, to argue against reference as a foundational notion for linguistic semantics. So things like London is big and polluted, where what you mean is that something like London's surface is big and something like its air is polluted. Uh, you know, this is precisely the place where you want to have a logical form, where you sort of shift the reference of London in ways that are arguably systematic. And these shifts are very similar in nature 
and in you know substance to what uh, what I am calling here modulations, and that I'm using to demarcate the line uh, between grammatically trivial and logically determined uh, sentences. Or, you know, this book is, has 200 pages and it's scary, all of those things, as well as the more pragmatic types of, you know, type shifting, like, you know, the Boston office call or the ham sandwich wants this check to quote famous examples from the literature. Um, one of the reasons why I am interested I'm so interested in this um, topic, besides, you know, that it gives a very clear role of logic in, in, in grammar, has to do with the difference between absolute versus model theoretic approaches to semantics. Now, this has been a very good example of a foundational divide that has crossed the field. And if you read semantics, textbooks, you'll see that some uh, go model theoretic and others go absolute. And um, roughly speaking, for those of you uh, that don't have a sense of what this is about, an absolute definition of truth uh, is relative to domains and to worlds and to assignments, but basically gives the semantics of content words it fixes them in an absolute fashion by relying on the competence of the speaker. So, you know, something like a function, uh, you know, the meaning of run applied to an individual at a world returns one just in case that individual in that world runs. And in the second instance, you are relying on the competence of a speaker uh, to understand how the truth conditions is fixed. You know, and that's a classical way in which, for instance, Donald Davidson would, would uh, have it, okay? Uh, this quick time warning. Yes. Sorry, Gennaro, quick time warning about three minutes. That's, that's good, I, I, I'm nearly done. Um, uh, so this contrast with um, you know, the model theoretic approach and in the model theoretic approach, the interpretation of uh, sort of non-logical constants um, is part of the context, in a sense. It can change from context to context. Now, the definition, um, the definition of the absolute definition and the model theoretic definition yield pretty much the same results, except in cases like one and two. So. The absolute definition of truth uh, predicts that something like there is water in that class entails there is oxygen in that class. Now, I find this problematic if you know you are using entailment to characterize the speed of competence. We want to distinguish knowledge of meaning from knowledge of hidden essences and the like. Knowledge of meaning grows spontaneously in the child with very limited environmental input. Hidden essences are a totally different ball game. Um, well, basically I think that appeal to modulation enables you to reconcile these views. Enables you to see how these views can be merged. I th think I won't be able to tell you exactly how this reconciliation takes place. Uh, but I think it does, it does happen. Um, and so, you know, this business about modulation is not meant to be the grand theory of everything, but it's a way of identifying the home of context dependent variation on some general logical compositional structures. Um, including type shifting of various sorts. Um, what happens is that we have a cool way of sifting the role of logic in grammar for its, from its role in general deduction. Sentences that are logically determined on any modulation 
are outright ungrammatical. Um, and we can now address, hopefully, the question that Robin raised to my attempt. Um, and, you know, logic enters directly into the definition of grammaticality. And we may have a way of reconciling model theoretic versus absolute notions of truth and consequences. And we also have, you know, we, we, we get ready for uh, new outstanding questions. Like how do the logical operations that languages use, for instance, even I mentioned, emerge out of the space of logically possible operators? What are substantive constraints on modulations? Lots of interesting work has been done on both of these questions. And especially how are subconscious emphasis computed? This might be the point on which we lag behind the most. And thanks, especially thanks to Barbara, who ventured there before and showed us how to. Thank you, Gennaro, for a great talk. Um, let me just uh, remind our audience that you can uh, submit questions through the Q&A feature. So there's a little button at the bottom that says Q&A. If you don't see it, you may have to click on dot, 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 or more. Um, and then we will call out on you um, to um, ask your questions. So I have a first question from uh, Yinan Sun. Um, let me, I'm sorry if I'm not getting your name right, and I will give you permission to speak. Um, you should now be able to unmute yourself. Oh, I'm sorry, I just now see that uh, they asked that I read out the question. Um, sorry, handling too many things at once. So um, I have a question, this is from Yunan San, about the distinction between the grammatical de-neutral sentences and ungrammatical ones. It seems to me that the former category, like it rains and it doesn't, is informative because we can calculate some kind of conversational implicature from it through Gricean reasoning. Well, we cannot do so with the latter, there is any cookie left. Is it possible that this difference also plays a role? So, uh, you see, we would have also, we would need a, a reason for why we can compute the implicature in one case and not in the other, right? This, is, this would be the, the, the first step. Why is it that in one case you can compute an implicature and in the other you can't? Right? Uh, so maybe, but this is, there has to be a reason why one is possible and the other is, is not possible. And I think that the reason has to do with the fact that you, you know, when you have something like it rains and it doesn't, you stand a chance and reinterpreting the content word in a way that doesn't make the thing contradictory, it makes it sort of uh, logically uh, contingent and therefore, you know, the implicature can kick in. Um, but in the case of something like, you know, there is even one cookie left, there is no chance to do that. No reinterpretation will uh, give you something that is not logically determined. So I think you are on the right track, but I think that you know, uh, there is a need for looking for a sort of a deeper structural um, account of the differences here. Thank you, Jennifer. Um There is another question that the question asker asked for it to be read out loud. So I will read it. It is from, and apologies for mispronouncing the name, Srikar Ragothaun. Um, I have a clarification question. Does the modulation account predict an independence between two occurrences of the same content words? 
I have in mind contrasts of the following sort. One, it is, it is and it isn't raining, um, no marking, and then hashtag mark, it isn't and it is raining. Uh, that's uh, a very uh, cute example, and I am not sure, right? So um, there is clearly, you know, some kind of a preference for having the um, the positive sentence precede the negative one in the kind of examples. And I don't know uh, on flight whether by playing with context also your example would uh, would improve. Um, uh, you know, the general point remains that yes, you do want to do precisely that, right? You want to sort of when you have occurrences of the same content word, on the one at one level you want to register that, uh, and at another level you want to be able to possibly modulate them independently so that you can rescue the the, the contradictoriness or the the, the uh, tautologous tautologousness. Um, so yeah. Thank you. Um, we have one more question coming in, again, asking to be read out loud um, a, from Lisa Bulinina. Um, a question about the title of the talk. It includes a reference to natural logic. Do you mean Van Bentham's natural logic? Could you please elaborate on this? Oh, I see yes. a general connection between what you say and Van Bentham's work, but I'd be curious to know more. Do yes. we need a different yeah. logic to account for the connection between logic and grammaticality yeah. or different architecture of grammar? Uh, well, that's a lovely question. I don't know very well um, as to the connection of this to, to Van Bentham's uh, proposal. I can tell you what I have in mind. And what I have in mind is that uh, what we see in language on the one hand um, is a fairly peculiar array of logical primitives. To give you uh, an example, uh, take quantifiers, right? Uh, in logic, it's very clear, generalized quantifiers are relations between sets, okay? In language, you find generalized quantifiers that roughly correspond to determiners, adverbial quantifiers that are typically intentional. You find alternative sensitive quantifiers like even and only, and you find polarity sensitive quantifiers, like any. And this grouping seems to be distinctive to language. And I am not sure where it comes from, but I see it there. So on the one hand, by natural logic, I mean a logic that has the architecture uh, that is reflected in languages. And then the other thing is the way in which this logic is used. And that's what I alluded to today. That is to say, logic is used not only to give you the categories of the expressions that exist and don't exist in natural language, but it's also used to compute certain form of grammaticalities along the, line, the lines that I've sketched. So by natural logic, I mean these two things. I mean the shape of logic itself, which is peculiar, and the way in which this is used in uh, grammar, which is also peculiar. And yeah, and you know, the, the, the investigation of the distinction between logical and non-logical, which is so tantalizingly related to the functional content distinction is one that we share with logicians. Because clearly their mode of characterizing that, that leans towards what I alluded to in terms of uh, domain neutrality, um, it's clearly, you know, it clearly is related to the notion of function. The notion of function is broader. We're about out of time, but a certain Barbara Parti submitted I, I a question, I and I will, I will let her have it. <laughs> the question. Yeah. yeah. Yes. And you know, somebody suggests you might stop sharing your screen so that yes, we can yes, see you better. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, so so that, that London example had just one occurrence of London. London is big and polluted with a conjoined predicate phrase. Yeah. Your analysis had two occurrences of London so that yeah. you could put two different modulations yeah, on yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Um, is that necessary? Does this say something about the impossibility of doing surface compositionality? Um, that would worry me. <laughs> um, well, it, it is true, Barbara, that why I have followed you on so many things. I may be less of a surface compositional guy than you are. <laughs> I don't always do it myself either. <laughs> uh, or, you know, or have my own brand of surface. I'm just, just ask. At any rate, this, this thing is totally negotiable. Totally negotiable. I, you know, we have to find the right way that it works. And it will depend on the assumptions that we make about syntax, absolutely. Whether, you know. Because I wondered a, if you might modulate the adjectives instead of the noun. Yes, you can, absolutely. All the sort of content words can be modulated, absolutely, yes. Yes, and we need to fight the right constraints. Let me I'm add afraid. <laughs> oh, ju just one to, more sentence. <laughs> one more sentence, because I see Kai's point. Yes, of course, I am um, recycling the notion of logical, natural logic from, from the late 60s. And uh, I did give uh, a version of this talk in Berkeley where George Lakoff was there. And um, so, yes, yes, of course, this is an, an old theme, uh, sort of refurbished. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it at that for now, so we can make time for our next speaker. Thank you for a wonderful talk tomorrow. I'll clap for everyone, and Barbara can clap too. Um, all right, let me change the settings here, and um, our next talk is going to be by Polly Jacobson, whom I go. I'm going to add to the video here and take it away, Polly. Okay, let me do a share screen. Uh, let me get the right share. This is it. Okay. Um, it asked me to start my video, but my video's on. So the video's on, right? No problem? You, you're all good. Okay, a quick okay. reminder before you get started just to everyone so they know um, you can submit questions through the Q&A throughout the talk. Please indicate if you want them to be read out loud. We can also unmute you. We're happy to unmute you. Um, but for anybody just joining us, uh, submit those questions. There's the Q&A feature at the bottom of the screen. Thanks. Okay, so um, what I want to do in this talk is to sort of advocate for three leading ideas. The first one is what was just talked about a little bit in the interchange between Barbara and Gennaro. And I'm channeling Montague here. I'm a very strong believer in what I call direct compositionality rather than surface compositionality. And this idea comes to us from Montague's work, but it really came into the field, I think, through Barbara's bringing this to people's attention. So the idea here is that the syntax is a system of rules which proves expressions well formed, often built with you know, use the metaphor of building expressions, often building larger ones from two or more smaller ones. And the semantics works in tandem with this to directly assign a meaning. And by a meaning, I mean a model theoretic interpretation, not a representation. As the syntax works to build expressions, the semantics compositionally interprets those expressions. And this is the direct compositionality claim. I don't like surface compositionality because it's not that you're reading meaning off of any level. It's that you're building the syntax and the semantics, you're building expressions and their meanings in tandem. And so the claim here is that there's no mapping between an actual pronounced level of representation to another level often called logical form, which then is assigned a model theoretic interpretation. And as I say, this idea comes from the work of Montague, but it was certainly brought into linguistics by Barbara Partia, especially in the 70s and 80s. So for example, uh, a paper that I really love is this paper by Parti and Bach, 1984, um, where they sort of stress that direct compositionality ought to be the desiderata, the gold standard. And I want to read a quote from their paper here, which says that they take as an initial assumption the idea that the semantics is a direct model theoretic interpretation of the syntax, 
An intermediate level of translation into intentional logic, or I'm adding here any other kind of logical representation, is dispensable. And they go on to say, this last hypothesis accords with Montague's assertion, but runs counter to most earlier and much current work in semantics by linguists. Well, current then was 1984, but this is still true. This runs counter to a lot of work in linguistics. Now, in that paper, they actually ended up concluding that logical form is not dispensable, but I think their reasons were they were too hasty, but to uh, go through why would be a different talk. So I'm not going to talk about that today. The second leading idea that will play some role in what I want to talk about is also comes into linguistics to some extent, not only, but partially through Montague, which is the uh, adoption of a categorical grammar syntax. The only part about that that's crucial for my talk today is the idea that syntactic categories directly encode syntactic distribution and that they also directly reflect the type of meaning an expression has. So for example, if you take an ordinary VP or an intransitive verb, we think of that as a function denoting a function from individuals to truth values. I've written that out in a sort of more um, transparent notation in blue. I've written out the normal linguistics notation in red. You can follow red or you can follow blue, or take your choice. Um, but so, you know, we think of this as a function and a verb phrase as a function from individuals to truth values or equivalently a set of individuals. And the idea in categorical, categorical grammar is that the syntactic category is parallel. It's really literally a function from NP strings to S strings. Um, and here again, is the usual categorical grammar notation. Or if you took a transitive verb, the idea is that this is a function from individuals to the above. So a function from individuals to individuals to truth values. And so in set terms, if you have the verb chase, it would map quirky uh, semantically into the set of porky chasers and syntactically it would map porky into the verb phrase to chase porky. So it's syntactic categories of function from NPs to NPs to S's. The key part being here that the syntactic category encodes the distribution. It encodes the slots that it can get to fill things. And the third idea I want to talk about is a variable free semantics, which I will elucidate below comes from various sources. But before I get to what that is, let me do two interludes. So the first is the well-known treatment of quantified NPs from Montague 74 and other places common to most theories with or without variables. And that's just something like every third grade boy generalized quantifier. It's a set of sets, the set of all sets with third grade boys as a subset. So every third grade boy sang in the concert gets put together by taking the set of singers in the concert and saying it's in the every third grade boy set. Okay, now before I go into variable free semantics, let me talk about how binding is done in theories with variables. There's many different ways, but I'm going to talk about two main ways and I've got by necessity. I'm oversimplifying, of course, but I think I'm giving a decent enough idea here. So the sense we're going to be looking at is the sentence every third grade boy called his mother or called his mother at lunchtime. <clears throat> I have these indices here, but the indices are really just to show the intended reading. The other part of a variable free semantics is there's no indices in the syntax. So these are just there to give you the reading. So a very standard view, in fact, kind of the received wisdom in an awful lot of modern linguistics is that the interpretation of this on the relevant reading involves having every third grade boy out of the sentence at the level of representation uh, that's relevant for the semantics. And so crucially, this is making use of a level of logical form because this thing is not part of the sentence at that level. And so this is crucially not direct compositional. It also makes crucial use of variables. And the key idea of crucial use of variables means that the interpretation is relative to ways to assign values to variables. Okay, so here's a picture of what's going on here. This would be one way to represent that logical form. And the key thing is what happens here. So this sentence gets, it's interpreted compositionally, but it's not the surface sentence, it's this logical form. And this sentence is interpreted as X called X's mother. What is that? It's what we call an open proposition. It means it's a proposition only after you've, you've assigned some value to X. 
So it's a proposition relative to assignment of, val of values to variables. It then shifts by what is known as lambda abstraction to then give us the set of X as such that X called X is mother. Okay, at that point, X is no longer really relevant. I could have used Y, I could have used Z. The X is bound. This is not relative to a way to assign values to X. So it's not an open thing anymore. So that's now just the set of self's mother callers, and that's taken to be in the every third grade boy set. But the key point about this, I'm sorry about this laugh. <laughs> Here we go. The key point about this is that the domain of binding is the S. It's this shift here from this to this. So it's the binding step happens where we sort of close off the variable at a step where we already have the subject in place and we have the object in place. Okay. Now that's not direct compositional because it use, makes crucial use of this level of logical form. There is a variant of this which is direct compositional but still uses variables. And that's the so-called derived VP rule originally from part T73 and talked about in various other places, which I think has actually gone underappreciated. So it's sort of similar to what we just saw, except that the domain of binding crucially is the verb phrase. So the subject doesn't need to be pulled out. You don't need a logical form. The basic idea is that the verb phrase is interpreted as call X's mother. That's the set of you know, X mother's call, a set of Y such that Y call X, Y's calls X's mother. So that doesn't depend on the value of Y, but it does depend on the value of X. So that's still an open set. It's a set relative to ways to assign values to X. And that shifts by the derived VP rule, whose semantics I won't go into here, just take my word for it, that Barbara didn't formulate something that couldn't be formulated. <laughs> and that shifts by this derived VP rule into the set of X's who call their own mothers. And that then is the argument of this, just like we saw before. So the key thing here is the binding is a little more local. It's actually somewhere in between what we started with with the S level binding and where I want to get to in the variable free program. It's a little more local. The shift happens on the meaning of the VP, but it still uses variables because we have this open set here for the VP. So from that, I want to turn to a variable free semantics. The idea of a variable free semantics is that there are no variables as part of the semantic machine, or sure, they're there in the notation. There are variable free notations, but nobody can understand them, um, except maybe Ed Keenan claims to. Um, using, let's say, combinatory logic notation, you can do a variable free notation, but I can't understand it. But they're only there in the notation. What that means is that no linguistic expression has a meaning that's relative to ways to assign values to variables. Okay, we still need a binding step. I'll come back to that. Pronouns, what are they? They're not variables. They're simply the identity function from individuals to individuals. Expressions which contain pronouns that are informally speaking unbound within them are functions from individuals to something else. So are, something like she is, as I say, a function from individuals to individuals. I track this in the syntax, but that's not going to be really important for what we're looking at. Uh, and pronouns, like I say, can, which these things or things with unbound pronouns within them combine with other things roughly by function composition. And I won't go through that part of the system either, but you can take my word for it that his mother will end up being the denoting the mother of function, the function that maps each individual to their own mother. So it's also a function of this type. Okay, how on earth though do we ever get these bound readings? And we do that again by a shift rule like the other two theories had, but it's very local. It's on the meaning of the transitive verb. Incidentally, the derived VP rule could be uh, generalized to do binding from objects and so can mine, but uh, you just take my word for it on that. So what we have here is a very local shift rule, which maps an ordinary two-place relation between individuals to a relation that holds between an individual and a function from individuals to individuals. And I call that mapping Z. So what is this? Well, in function terms, in other words, it takes this individual, this function which goes from individuals to individuals to truth values, maps that to a function from individuals to individuals to a function from individuals to truth values. Or you can look at this in red if you want to look at the sort of easier way for me anyway to look at it. The question is, what is this mapping? And in order to tell you what this mapping is, it's easiest to just give by example. 
So take the verb call. It's of the right type to input this rule because it's a two-place relation between individuals. Z call is something that wants a function from individuals to individuals. And it returns a set of things that stand in the ordinary call relation uh, to that function applied to self. Okay, it takes a function in F and returns the set of X's who call F of X. Similarly love, to Z love some function F is to be an X who loves F of X. All right, so let's see how that works in our example here. It's sort of like the same example we had earlier, but here's where the so-called binding happens. There's no pronoun involved. You don't bind at the level where there's already a pronoun with a variable in it, or you don't bind at the level where there's already a subject here. It's just that call maps to Z call. Think of it as transitive verb mapping to a fancy transitive verb. Now what's Z call? It's to Z call some function is to be an X who calls F of X. What is his mother? Well, we already saw it. That's a function from individuals to individuals. It's the mother function. So Z call now takes this as its argument. And what we get out is lo and behold, just what we've been seeing before, the set of X's who call their own mother. Because to Z call the mom function is to be an X who calls the mother of X. And that's what we have here. Just like we had in the other two theories, but we got this in this extremely local way, okay? And um, so the last step is just like what we've been seeing in the other theories. This then, the semantics then says this set, the set of self mother callers, is in the every third grade boy set. Since that's a set of sets with all the third grade boys in them, we arrive at the right truth conditions. So the difference here is that when you do the binding, the subject is not already in place, nor is the object. It's just done extremely locally. I have to zoom out. Okay. Now, before I uh, go on to the main thing I want to look at in this talk, let me show you a kind of um, immediate payoff of this way of thinking about things. And this is that it gives us a direct compositional analysis of some cute facts that I'm going to get to. So first, let me step back and talk about this construction called right node raising. And I'm basing this discussion here on work by Steedman and Dowdy um, in the 80s, where if you have a sentence like every semantic student loved and every phonology student hated the course on model theoretic semantics, they show that you can give a direct compositional interpretation of this using techniques of categorical grammar without having to posit a logical form, without having to tease it apart into two sentences. Basically, given the category of grammar syntax plus a uh, standard view of semantic types, they show that every semantic student can function composed with love, and that ends up giving the set of things that every semantic student loves. And ditto for every phonology student hated, you function compose every phonology student with hated, you get this kind of funny constituent, but there it is, it acts like a constituent in this construction. Then these two intersect, so you're getting those things which are both in the set of things that every semantic student loves and every phonology student hates. And then the rest says that the course on model theoretic semantics is in that set. Now, what's interesting about this construction is you can get this where you've got a kind of a binding, what's sometimes called across the board binding. So take something like every third grade boy loves and every fourth grade boy hates his homeroom teacher. This is fine. It has this kind of across the board reading. But in a standard way of looking at things, it's very hard to see how to do this without teasing this apart into two sentences. The problem being we have one his, and yet it's bound by two separate things. How are we going to do that? And in fact, on the S level binding rule, there's no sort of sense here to do the binding on it. In the derived VP rule, there's also no VP here. There's just a transitive verb. The reason why this is completely unproblematic in variable free semantics is that the binding step happened at the level of a transitive verb. So in general, I think the important moral of this example is it shows why variable free semantics is a very happy kind of thing to marry with direct compositionality because it makes everything very local. And if things are very local, you don't need these big sort of spans of things to start moving things around and turning them to some other logical form. You can just combine these meanings. So the binding step is local and the pronoun contributes locally, not by contributing a variable, but just by making that object a function. 
So what's happening here is that every third grade boy function composes with zeros to give the set of functions f such that every third grade boy is an x who loves f of x. And the same thing happens over here in the every fourth grade boy hates. You get the set of functions f such that every fourth grade boy is an x who hates f of x. Those two then intersect and you get the set of functions f that are such that both every third grade boy z loves f and every fourth grade boy z hates f. And his homeroom teacher, because it contains his pronoun unbound in that domain, is automatically a function mapping each boy to his homeroom teacher, and it puts that in that intersection. And voila, we're home free, direct compositional, very simple analysis. Okay. Now, at this point, I want to sort of get to the main punchline of this talk. I think I have 12 minutes left. I hope that's right, moderator. Um, so, I want to talk about the syntax of Z. So I'm assuming this tight fit between the syntax and the semantics demanded by categorical grammar. And so under that view, it would probably be not enough to have Z apply to one of these functions from one of these things whose meaning is a function from individuals to a function from individuals to truth values, that is a two place function. But we would expect its syntax to be parallel. We would expect it to only apply to things with this kind of syntactic category, something that says I can combine with an object and then I can combine with the subject to get an S. So it should have this information as part of its input. And the next question is, is that prediction correct? Well, I will argue that it is. So in order to argue that it is, I want to introduce an apparent puzzle. This puzzle is well known in the literature. And it's been uh, goes under the rubric of I with an I effects, which I think is not a very good name for it, but I'll use it for convenience. So imagine that I go to a small party and besides me, there are three married couples, Alice and Abe, Betty and Bert and Kathy and Christine. Betty and Bert were childhood sweethearts and all the others met their spouses recently. And suppose I really enjoyed Betty. So you ask me how I like the party and I could end up saying, you know, it's really interesting. I especially enjoy talking to Betty. But suppose I don't remember Betty's name, but I do remember Bert's name, and I remember that she's married to Bert. So you can imagine me saying one of the following two things. It was really interesting. I especially enjoyed talking to, oh gosh, what's her name? You know, the woman married to Bert. Or I could say, it was really interesting. I especially enjoyed talking, yeah, what, oh, what's her name? You know, the wife of Bert. Now supposing I also don't remember Bert's name, but I do remember that they were childhood sweethearts. So then I could say, you know, it was really interesting. I especially enjoyed talking to, oh, you know, what's her name? You know, the woman married to her childhood sweetheart. But I can't say, you know, I really enjoyed talking to, oh gosh, what's her name? The wife of her childhood sweetheart. That just doesn't go through. But why? One would think that married to and wife of mean the same thing, except that wife has the gender thing in there, but that should not be making the difference. So they seem to be the same type and have basically the same meaning. In case those facts didn't pop, let me get you uh, a, a better way, a, another way to see these. Let's add in a few more people at the party. And you asked me if I learned anything interesting about the group of people at the party. And I can say, well, maybe, you know, I learned that Betty is the only woman married to her childhood sweetheart. This actually has two readings. One is the pragmatically salient one, which I will call the covariant reading. And it's probably the reading that you got in this context. It's the one that says she's the only ex such that X is married to X's childhood sweetheart. It does have the silly other reading though, which is just telling you that Bert is not polygamous. So if we interpret the her as Betty, it could mean the only ex married to Betty's childhood sweetheart, which isn't really an interesting thing to learn in our society given our normal conventions. But I'll call that the non-polygamy reading. Despite the fact that that's the odder, less salient reading, it's actually the only reading for the following in 12. I've put five, that should be 12. Um, you say, I say, well, you, did you learn anything interesting? And I say, yeah, well, maybe. I learned that Betty is the only wife of her childhood sweetheart. In that case, it doesn't have the co-varying reading. What it means is that I learned that Betty is the only, uh, that Bert is not polygamous, okay? So this is a general fact about what are called relational nouns, nouns that denote two place relations between people. And we'll see some further uh, examples of this in a little bit. Okay, 
So what's the difference between married to and wife of, other than the fact that you know, wife of has the gender in there? They both denote these two place relations and, you know, the, and, and very similar ones. But actually this follows from what I just said about the syntax of Z as necessitated by the categorical grammar program. What I said was that if we really take categorical grammar seriously, we would expect this shift, the Z binding shift, to only happen to things that's, that encode that they are waiting for a subject. They don't always have to get their subject, but they have to have as part of their syntactic, syntactic category that they can get a subject. And it turns out that there's good evidence that something like married to does have a slot for a subject, but wife of does not. And here's the evidence. So first I wanna say marriage to does have this slot, at which point you should say, really? I mean, Betty married to Bert is not a sentence. Well, it's not a main clause sentence, but it is a, a sentence-like thing in what is called small clauses. So you can think, you could say things like, well, with Betty married to Bert, she might be able to convince him to move to Providence. Or to use the example we've been looking at, with Betty married to her childhood sweetheart, she's probably really sick of celebrating these when we first met anniversaries. So it has a category that says, give me an NP and give me a subject and I'll give you a small clause. And we can think of a small clause as something very similar to a sentence, okay? So it does have the right syntax for Z. But relational nouns don't. They don't have subject slots because nouns don't have subject slots. They never, even in small clauses, uh, occur with subjects. So you can't get with Betty, wife of Bert, she might be able to convince him to move to Providence. Remember, you get with Betty married to Bert, she might be able to convince him, but not with Betty, wife of Bert. So nouns just seem to be a primitive category, not, not a function category. And given that, it follows that we're not going to be able to send this thing through this Z rule, and we're going to get the co-varying reading for the only woman married to her childhood sweetheart, but not the only wife of her childhood sweetheart. At this point, you might say, wait, that's cool, it's nice analysis, but it doesn't really argue for this view of binding over others, because after all, the derived VP rule could say exactly the same thing. It could say derived VPs are only VPs, that is things with subject slots. If it were married to a categorical grammar, it would make the same prediction. The S binding, uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the discussion of what happens at S level binding. I'll just say it can do that too. It has problems though with this case. So I want to go right to the other case though that I think really gives evidence for the highly local shift. So what I want to say is although these other theories might be able to make the same prediction, there's a striking case where this very local kind of shifting the binding step gives us evidence for, for the very local type of uh, rule here. So um, uh, just suppose there were a case where you had an item listed in the lexicon with this subject slot. That is an ordinary transitive verb, but where you had a productive morphological rule mapping it to a relational noun. And of course we have that. It's the er suffix of the gent of nominals. So like Corey ch ardently chases rabbits, but we have also Corey is an ardent chaser of rabbits. Okay, so we have transitive verbs that map to relational nouns. The transitive verbs are sitting there in the lexicon with this subject slot as part of their category. This is what would be its category. And so it has that, but supposing, therefore, it could undergo this Z binding rule and then shift to the relational noun. And for at least some speakers, that can happen. So this predicts that there would be a contrast with this I, I with an I effect between relational nouns that are transparent agentive nouns derived by this morphological rule and those in the lexicon. And before I give you the evidence that that's right, let me just say, I like the history of this because I didn't think of this prediction and then go out and look for the facts and talk myself into them. In fact, a couple of times when I gave a talk on these I with an I effects up to this point, two different times with two different people said, you know, I don't get this effect with transparent um, uh, agentive nominals. And I sort of thought, hmm, um, gee, I don't really know why that should be. That's interesting, but I don't have an explanation. 
But then I went back and I thought, and I do have an explanation because if they're transparently derived adjunctive nominals, they're sitting there as transitive verbs and they can undergo Z and then map to the relational noun. And so I actually now do get these contrasts. I mean, I hadn't thought about it before. I, I, I am a speaker who gets these contrasts. Let me tell you before I give the sentences that in order to show that these, these contrasts, we need to make up sort of strange agentive nominals because we want to make sure that they're not sitting in the lexicon. We want to make sure that they're derived from these transitive verbs. And so they're going to be odd. So you're going to find the transparent agentive nominal ones odd. But the point is, even if you find them odd, I think you will see a contrast between their ability to get the covariant reading and the ability of the lexical ones to not get the covariant reading. Okay, so first one, this has been vetted by a lot of speakers, not quite the sentence, but this type of uh, the, these, the word lover. So Sally is the only lover of her mother's taste in wine. I'm using lover here in the sense of one who loves, and that's okay on the covariant reading. But Sally is the only lover of her mother's tax accountant does not have the covariant. To give another example, supposing it's instead of talking about friending people on Facebook, let's just change the language a little bit and say we talk about befriending people on Facebook. Okay, so we befriend them and then we could have befrienders. Bert is the only befriender of his mother's boss. I think that's fine on the covariant reading. Bert is the only friend of his mother's boss. That only has a lonely boss reading. Whether that's the Facebook sense of friend or the other sense of friend, that's only the lonely boss. Finally, one other word that I just made up, assassinator. Stupid word, right? Because we have assassin, it's blocked by assassin. But let's suppose I just said it anyway, you would know what I meant. So imagine we have a group of rebels from different countries, each bragging about having assassinated some government official from the government of their country. And I say, well, Lee is the only assassinator of his country secretary of state. This can have the covariant reading. If I say Lee is the only assassin of his country's secretary of state, that's only saying there's only one person involved in the assassin. It's that there is no conspiracy theory reading. Okay, so I think that you get these facts only by this hypothesis that the so-called binding step happens to the transitive verb before it maps to the relational noun. And that in turn is evidence for this variable free approach, which in turn is a boon to direct compositionality because of the way it makes everything very local. So the morals are, I just told you these first two, the most important moral I want to take from all this is that all this is compatible with direct compositionality. I think the hope that was expressed in Partey and Bach as they were channeling Montague should not be abandoned. We should all be hoping that direct compositionality is correct. It's kind of the no brainer way for the um, grammar to be put together. And in a completely different vein, the other point I'd like to draw is that odd little corners of the language like these relational nouns can be quite illuminating. And of course, this is a lesson that we've all learned from the many, many partee sentences over the years that every, um, every semanticist has a list of partee sentences. She has shown us how little corners of the language can really have big consequences. And I hope we all keep our eye on this as we move ahead. And I am done, so thank you. Okay, I'll stop the share, okay. Thank you so much, Polly. We've got about uh, 10 minutes for questions now. Um, and the uh, audience is, uh, I'll briefly remind folks, uh, please use the Q&A option at the bottom to uh, submit a question in writing. And then I'll select some of those questions uh, for, for Polly to answer. I'll just wait a moment for folks to possibly submit their questions. Actually, um, I might go ahead and <laughs> seize the moment since no questions have come in. Um, Polly, I have a question I've always kind of wanted to ask you about the, the lack of indices um, in, uh, in your theory and the variable free semantics. Um, it just has to do with the fact that, um, so in some of the literature on signed languages, um, folks uh, claim to have arguments that in wow. these languages, the, the indices actually show up overtly, right in, in the, you know, the acts of pointing and the sign space. Um, 
And so, so I was curious if, if you had thoughts on that, because uh, I know it's controversial within that literature as well as to whether that's the right story. Well, um, I think there's a couple of things that one could say about. One is it is controversial, as you probably know, there's a paper by Jeremy Kuhn arguing that these are really agreement markers and not indices, okay? If they are indices, they're not really the same kind of indices as the indices in syntax that people propose in a, a theory with variables. And one thing, one reason why I think we should be suspicious of, so uh, what Seth is talking about for those who don't know is you sort of set something up in space and then you point to the different parts and people say those are like indices. But notice there's a huge difference between that and the so-called indices in syntax that people propose, which is that those really are different. They're pronounced, they're signed differently. I mean, the sign is the same, but their placement is different. But I would argue that there's absolutely, uh, look, I don't know, I shouldn't say no language, but nobody has ever, I think, uh, claimed to find a language where we say he sub I and he sub J. So those are very different from that kind of device in sign space that we have in spoken languages because we don't have a pronounced difference between these indices. And I've always felt that that's one of the reasons to be very suspicious about indices is we don't pronounce them differently. Um, uh, wait a second, I see something. Okay, all right, wait a minute. <laughs> okay, so um, yes, yeah, so that's a sort of two-part answer. As you know, there's some question as to whether or not those really function as indices and therefore as variables. But second of all, they're really a very different creature. They're almost like different reference points. And that's not what we find in spoken languages. Does that uh, satisfy you? Yeah, OK. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, welcome. So we have, uh, we have another question from a panelist. Uh, there's a question from Florian Schwartz. So Florian, go ahead. Yeah, Polly, a very nice talk. I had a question just briefly about, or a, a comment and wanted to see what you thought about it, whether um, the sort of prefix self that you can get sort of incorporated in various environments um, might be actually nicely fitting, especially with your contrast for the relational nouns versus um, oh. the, the verb. So I think, you know, like in self-defense one, I'll have to follow on, on this uh, later. I just recently learned on some interesting work on, on Greek, where there's actual you know, stuff going on with the morphology and non-active voice. So I'll, I'll share that with you later. But my question was uh, partly whether you think you know, in self-defense, whether that might pattern similarly and maybe also what your judgment is. So my, my first hunch as a non-native speaker though, um, right, is that self-assassinator <laughs> might make some <laughs> sense. But self-assassin, oh, no. You're right. You're right. <laughs> so, what, what do you have you thought about this? No, no. But I get a sharp contrast. I'm not sure whether that does fit, but uh, I do get that contrast. A self-assassinator. A self-assassin means nothing, right? Is that what you're? I mean, I don't know what it means That's, to be a self-assassin. Yeah, it it certainly doesn't mean the obvious thing that self-assassinator right. does. Right. I thought it fit. If, if one of them is really clearly de-verbal de and the other one is not, right? You're gonna to have to look at the morphology, I guess. Yeah, 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 no, exactly. Let's see if that works with the other case I had. Well, let's not do self-lovers. <laughs> I don't wanna go there, but um, uh, what was my other example? The self-befriender and the self-friend also. But it could just be that you only get the self blah, blah, blah because it has to be verbal. It could be that rather than the semantic fact. I love the fact, but I'm not sure that it's support for me. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, it, no, I hear you. Um, yeah, yeah, it could just be sense. that you only get self with something that has verbal morphology and not the uh, not not a not just a, a, a relational noun that's lexical. It, it'll be interesting to take a closer look at the Greek stuff I'm thinking of. So I'll I'll share that with you later. Okay, thank you very much. And the others. There's a Q&A. Yes, there's one from uh, Larry Horn. So okay. I'm gonna invite him to ask his question. Hi, Larry. Hi, Polly. Uh, okay, uh, I don't know whether to read it or just to have Seth read it, but uh, basically I agree with your uh, judgments on the uh, lack of a uh, subject place for wife in with uh, the small clause with Bert um, uh, with with Betty, wife of Bert, but um, I find perfectly acceptable with uh, Betty, the wife of Bert, or assuming uh, that we allow for polygamy with Betty, a wife of Bert, 
And I just wonder whether that uh, you know, challenges the assumption that you are making. Certainly the case does not, it's absolutely happy, fine, because we do get um, uh, things, uh, well, you know, the and P is predicative. So um, it's, yeah, I mean, we see it in those cases with John the president, with Bill the wife of Bert. It's only, the claim is only that you don't get it with the nouns, that nouns don't have subject slots. So NPs can shift into predicative things, which can then have subject slots. And for uh, well, talked question. about that, and some nouns do too, but only the nouns that are sort of death, uh, have to be unique. And I guess wife doesn't because it can't do that. But you know, with something like, you know, with Biden president, we'll get a good mm -hmm. uh, stimulus bill passed. So you sometimes get it with nouns. It sometimes looks like we can do it, but I think those shift to NPs. So NPs can do this, but not just bare nouns. And that's the only crucial part to my claim. Okay. Yeah. Oh, uh, there's there's a data observation from Brian Bukala. I don't know if you see it, Polly. I might invite him to. I, I did, yeah, okay. But I'm uh, flooring thought... data point. A self cooker is a, <laughs> a self chef is uninterpretable. Um, yeah, so I'm not sure what to say about that. But I mean, a self cooker is okay, I guess, if you, you know cook people and you couldn't cook yourselves. Um, Hence insane. <laughs> insane, right, that's right, that's right, that's right. But yeah, so it might be, but but Barbara had a thing in chat saying self-love is also fine. So Barbara, could you unmute and can I ask you, are you then saying that it really is not just about verbs? Because that would be really nice for me if it was not just about verbs. Yeah, 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 I mean, I think I think there's quite a I, I didn't try to think of a whole bunch, but self-love and self-hate and stuff as as nouns are common. They're they're not it doesn't it doesn't take away from your earlier point. It's just no, no. saying no, it doesn't seem to be morphologically limited to to non-nouns. Well that would be great because then Florian's observation would be like sort of perfect. That would fit right into what I'm saying. So my worry was that there might be this independent explanation for Florian's observation. But yeah, somebody points out here, Florian's point, these are de-verbal. I mean, love and hate are verbs. So um, do we know that this isn't, you know, that these aren't really just the verbs, the derived from verbs type nominals? Yeah, I don't know. Somebody I don't know needs either. to work on that. I don't know either. <laughs> it's something to look at. It's definitely something to, to look more at. Is something in self defender. Okay, somebody has written up a self defender versus self shield. Again, that's the question though whether these are these de verbal nouns or not. All right. Um, we've got time, I think, for just about one more question. Um, but. Uh... If not, then then maybe we'll thank uh, Polly one more time for her excellent talk. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you.